Yeah. See, in my playthrough, she was like, well, how could you do this to me? Yeah, because I guess it was because uh, she was just disliked instead of hated. Oh yeah, this is this is an odd scene. So we've just flown to Greece without having any indication that we just did. Yeah. But yeah. Other than our clothing changing. Oh, wait. I'm pretty sure our clothes changed. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we're now in the finale. Technically. So what, they're just yeah. gonna sit back and let the cash registers fill? Not yet. I do hate that Still the game just automatically says you told which is the finale, even if you it. might want to dick around in that safe house more. I bet you can't yeah, even go back to safe houses, because... I know, I that would be really cool. God, I have a really cool sound system in my Moscow safe house. Shut up, <laughs> shut up, you console player. And it's pretty cool and all. Seamus, did you play it on console or on PC? You'll be rogue forever. Until someone finds you and kills you. So I can't free. imagine trying to is aim to on PC with on well, console with this. I wonder if it's just jittery if it is, as it is on PC. Because aiming on PC is Honestly, terrible. I don't understand. It might just be that I'm recording and stable. Haha, we did get some sick sounds in the recording. That was me. Oh. That was me sneezing. Well, fine. Uh -huh. Darn. They think they're starting a cold war that they can live on. <coughs> Halbeck isn't exposed. Oh god, that sounded terrible. Exposed. <laughs> Ow. You. I honestly don't know. If you sound like patient. <laughs> you sound like patient zero of the coming <laughs> zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and this is a great monkey impersonation. you care? I told him this is what the dossier was. Okay, here we go. I care about stopping what's about to happen. I read your dossier, Mina. Yeah, the do your whole life serving you. Oh, yeah, because we filled up her dossier. So I guess cool. I need a little more on what your agenda is. If you can get to Alpha Protocol, Mike, I can answer all your questions. Before I do anything, answer one for me. Are you the one who set me up? Not. Be be unjustifiably outraged at the fact that I she saved your life. To your location. Did cut you off from the agency. Outrage! I used Alpha Protocol for its intended purpose. And I got to be the victim? I yeah, so. Why. I saw your dossier, Mike. And I thought you were someone who would. <laughs> <laughs> so I you How this. many innocent people have we go. shot for no reason? And I purposely <laughs> cut you off from Westridge. <laughs> A lot. Who are you actually working for? I can't discuss that. Uh. But they want to prevent what's about to happen. And they want to see programs like Alpha Protocol shut down. Even if they hurt the United States? This is a pretty Alpha interesting Protocol critique on United government States overreach well yeah. before the current scandals that have been yeah. occurring in recent history. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, I didn't Not pick ours. up on this before, but this is Bro, some pretty profound stuff so talking about accountability. Especially and in the context of the modern day. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. It's especially <laughs> fitting. Imagery. Although I mean, it's, like, it's ironic that you... she's from the NSA here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, <laughs> post WikiLeaks so and post the NSA spying, this all takes on kind of a different dimension. Yeah. That would be funny as if in the middle. Oh, do you have a, a click icon in your body? <laughs> That's <hilarious>. Yes. <laughs> It would be interesting if one of your missions was a parallel to WikiLeaks, where there was a totally um, non violent you know, just a civilian that was against what you were doing, and, and you had to decide if you wanted to assassinate them or not. What if there was, like, a mission before, like, when you are still working out protocol, where you had to assassinate someone who was leaking documents from the United States? Yeah. Like, just Oh, wow, that is a lot of emails. Of course, we, don't have, we really don't need to go through them since... No, we'll go through them uh, next time. Yeah, yeah, we'll go through them next time. Yeah, but this is basically where we are setting up our end game in these next few missions. See, let me see here. You should probably put a manual just save here, we have. just so that you, uh, yeah. you don't delete it all. No, don't leave. I can, this is actually the last mission right here. Yeah, we have two contact out. missions, then the final mission that we can take on. But that's that's not for now. That's for... Oh. That's for our grand finale. Oh yeah, and we won't we Which won't have the contact the very last the week after this actually in a row. Hopefully, because I'll be out of class. We'll discuss. God. We'll discuss after the show. Anyways, so, we might um, be able to gonna... finish this before I start class in in a month. 
Yeah. Who's going to be your guest next week? Are you finally going to have Tom Brader on? I think what we're going to do is just... It's a little too actually. expensive for us. Yeah, we're planning for the finale since it's since it's the mathly appropriate to go full circle. We're just going to have the three of us like we originally had it in the first episode. Yeah, that was the plan. Um, anyways, what I, what I normally like to do at the end of the uh, week, and I usually forget... Ask, is ask our guests, ask the guests what they their, their general opinion of the game, and if it's changed with their experience. Well, we can ha- we can record him saying it right now, and then just that's place it on to the end of the episode. So that's what I'm doing. So Seamus, what are your and, overall thoughts on the game? Seamus, um, my your overall <laughs> my overall thoughts on Al- Alpha Protocol are now as they were back then, which is really ambitious really admirable they didn't quite stick it from a gameplay perspective and they didn't quite have the resources to make it as to make the choices as good as they could have and it's a shame the game didn't do better i feel with just a little more polish and a little bit better buzz if this game had done well we could have seen more like it and so Um, it's a shame it didn't do better it's a shame it didn't do better i suppose Damn it, he there's started an article that came out. <laughs> you know, there's an article right after um, we started this season that claimed that uh, Alpha Protocol is the new Deus Ex. It was talking about um, oh. Revolution. Yep. And Ninja Game then flipped out when we linked it on our Twitters. That was, that was Why? Because he hates this game and loves Deus Ex. Oh. Um. You, you, I can justify hatred for this game. There is, it's very justifiable. I, yeah. I mean, you have to, you have to ignore what they were trying to do. What they were trying to do is Deus Ex. So in that case, in in that sense, I think that was kind of what they were aiming for. Yeah. The fact that they didn't hit it, it's a lot harder to do Deus Ex now. Case in point, yeah. Human Revolution didn't quite pull it off either. It's really, really hard. It's and a lot so, more money. Yeah, in yeah, there's a lot more money in, and there's a lot more money in not even trying. Um, go the more Bioware way, where everything's compartmentalized, where they don't continue to, choices don't continue to branch off forever, and it's a lot easier to pull off. Um, I'm that's an easier path to take. I'm hoping that with the recent renaissance of Project Eternity and Wasteland 2. That we can see a bit more, a few more games along the lines of, of choices actually mattering yeah. and story branching off in interesting ways. Because when you just have a bunch of text and no vo- very few vocal lines, you can do a hell of a lot and, um, yeah. on the fly even. The, the Planescape Torment school of doing things. I love that game. I only played yeah. it recently, but I love that game. Yeah, I need to finish it I, I always get stuck in the beginning because i'm like i must read everything oh my god there's so much you, to read you know what you that's just... it if we could give up the voice acting and move a lot of this to text it suddenly becomes like so much easier to do everything if you're just what? willing to give up the voice acting. because if you voice a, if you voice a line then you change and then you had to come back bring your actor yep. back and then re yeah. the line that's why you have to finally you normally finalize the script before you uh do the voice acting it's usually pretty late in the process but but yeah but i mean there's really you want thing. to you know you start play testing and people realize you know what this yeah. choice is going to be yes or this character you made this kid you intended this character to be funny and people see him as grading, and you're like, well, what do we... Because you're going to make mistakes like that. And if you can't refine, if you can't iterate, then you are going to have, well, a game like this one, where it's just got things that don't work. and does a lot things of things frustrate. really well, but it does a lot of things terribly. Um, yep. Project Eternity is going to be a big deal for Obsidian, because if it, if it ends up being, like, buggy and almost unplayable in places and iffy, then yeah. it's... Up it's until now, they blame the publisher, but since there's no yep. publisher here, if it's, if it's this, if Project Journey is shitty, that means Obsidian themselves just can't make a game right. right. Yeah. And so that would be a terrible thing to think of. Because there are a lot of games that Obsidian has made that a lot of people love. Like uh, New Vegas, especially. Yeah. This this will be the, the make-or-break game for Obsidian, this Project Journey. It, it sure will prove like once it. and for all whether or not it's Obsidian or the publishers. Yes. Yeah. That people will still so buy them. Debate. People will still buy them. I think even if it doesn't do. Well, I'm so sure because kind of thing, people but... like what Obsidian does and the way they think of yeah. game design. Hell, I do. 
And I yeah. think a, a lot of us here do too. A, a lot of people that follow uh, in our circles do, for sure. I am a little worried that they'll focus too much on mechanics. Because it seems like it seems like that's generally the worst part of a lot of Obsidian games. Or game mechanics. And well, that seems to get like away, recycle, get in the way well, of a lot of stuff. Well, but they're they're not. They're clearly going kind of base down like if you can the just bottom take... mechanics out and yeah. building everything anew and building tons of new systems. That might be a problem. I mean, it just might be. For one, this if, was, I mean, that if was this game's biggest problem is they had to make a whole new RPG system for it, and it it was just pretty bad all all things considered as opposed to the um, obsidian games where they built off of previous engines like neverwinter nights 2 and fallout new vegas and nice the old republic 2 well, well new vegas had flaws but it wasn't anywhere near as bad as this game had no, had. no. and most of them were inherited from Fallout yeah. 3 except for the stability as i think seamus said in the new vegas season it was in a bethesda engine game made by obsidian it was a miracle that thing worked <laughs> at all yes <laughs> Although I guess with how much people love Fallout 3, it was a miracle that people liked New Vegas at all. Because well, they're sure it was a very stupid. Well, New people. Vegas did well, I think. Like, yeah, it did do financially. Well. It did, it did. I think it may have actually ended up selling more than Fallout 3. Which proves that there might actually be a, a, a pretty big market for that kind of Fallout. Yeah. They're, they're very different. Um, I think uh, I've written about how that how they are very similar in terms of systems, but when you come yeah. to the overall design, they are extremely different games. Uh, it'll be I think Bethesda's making Fallout 4, or they're supposed to be. So it'll be interesting to see how far in the Fallout 3 direction that goes. I've heard of City and talk about making a Fallout in LA, and that seems interesting to me. I just um, want I don't care what they do, just stop setting it 200 years in the future. That drives me absolutely bonkers. I think with that's, that's actually Bethesda policy from what I heard. How far in the Bethesda future does the not go into the past. They must go I, always into the future. I would rather they trash the canon and have stuff that doesn't work with the canon than have stuff that just doesn't even work on its own. Okay. That's an interesting idea. I would agree with Seamus on that. I agree with Seamus. I don't agree with Anaphysic. Just on principle. Yeah. So, uh, what do you think of Project Eternity, Shannon? I have not been following it. I try not to get too much... I mean, to a certain extent, this is a bit like previews. Okay, this is an extension of the preview mindset, that always looking at what's coming next. Is it going to be good? Is it not going to be good? They, they did this in the past. Well, they might do this in the future. Well, somebody said this. And it's not bad. It's good that we take an interest in where our games come from, but I'm always wary of being a little too gossipy. Okay. And so, yeah, I mean, not that this story, I mean, this is an interesting story, but I try not to just follow the development of these games. You know, I know that they're being made, and then forget about them until they come out, and then take a look at them. Because if you get too wrapped up in the development, it you you get that sort of... You become biased. Pumping for news when there isn't any news. Well... Yeah. You begin trying to make news. Well, what do you think? This person says this about that thing. And yeah, you start manufacturing a story instead because there's not a lot to say about it. And you don't, yeah, and as far as becoming biased, you know, the, the, the plans are always more ambitious at the beginning and you don't want to be like, well, they said they wanted to do this and they didn't and so this game is horrible. Just, you know, note, hey, they're trying to do this and I'll see what it's like when, you know, a couple of years when it comes yeah. out. You have to consider Kickstarter too here because a lot of a lot of people are like, you need to give us updates on what you're doing like all the time. Yeah. So the dynamic is very different. See, I can't I just can't bring myself to put money in Kickstarter because I can't get into the paradigm of I put money down but I might not get stuff. Yeah. So um, I, I know my my thinking so I don't put money in the Kickstarter. It'll be interesting to see in a few and I guess after twenty fourteen. It'll be interesting to see which ones failed and which ones succeeded. I'm pretty sure most of the like multi-million dollar ones will act will come up with come out with something eventually. Although the thing with Double Fine makes me wonder if that's well. True. I'm nervous about Double Fine. I'm Double nervous Fine. About Double Fine didn't really go in with a much of a plan to begin with. I think a lot of the other ones did have a pretty decent design plan already. Yeah. Then again, Double Fine was basically let's make an adventure game. Yeah, that's what it was. It was yeah. Let's make an adventure game. And we'll Double figure Fine it out later. Pretty much. So uh, I'm thinking uh, since. They may have had a lot more. They may have known they were having financial difficulties when the um, 
massive chalice sticks that came out. That was the worst case of feature creep I've seen. I think of the double fine Kickstarter. Like that was clearly a feature creep situation. Yeah, that was the that was one of the first big Kickstarters. So it'll be interesting to see how that ends up. You this know, is actually, this, this is a good point about analysis. Kickstarter. Pretty much all the projects, so they have you know, what are they called? Uh, stretch goals and whatever, whatever. Which yeah. seem in general to try and match like what it would take to make this stuff. But that's I not, always that's wondered not about actual. That's not how actual game selling works. When you sell a game, or when you make a game, it's out there, and then you sell it. You might make, you know, twice as much as you spent on it back. You might make only fifty percent of what you spent on it back. You know, there's this wide variation in how much you actually get back from something. So just because, like, say, I forget how much money actually got poured into the Double Fine one, but, like, they they started out with an idea that was a $400,000 idea or something, maybe. And, and they I got think three about stretch goals but that they, always bother they me. Have, they could have just made a $400,000 game that ended up having, you know, yep. a lot of profit on it just because a lot of people wanted it. Yeah. The, the people who gave money were giving money to a four hundred thousand dollar game. They were not obligated to like. Well, we need to make a three million dollar game now. But the people wanted a four hundred thousand well, dollar game. Well, yeah. but when people give the um, the stretch goals and then they do that to get more money because um, yeah, theoretically, you always bugs they wouldn't me have about a lot of money. Kickstarter that them. you always get those goals like, oh, if you donate fifty dollars, you get this cool little pin and and you can come see Tim Schafer. And I'm like. I always thought to myself, wouldn't those start becoming more expensive than they were probably worth? A lot of them, I think several of them you have to provide for transportation is something I see. Yeah, but I mean, what, if you're sent, if you're buying like fifty thousand pins, and people order all or oh, over yeah, like yeah, fifteen it's true. dollars. It's true. That's taking money right out of your budget. It can be this, a big deal. This yeah. Is the problem with a number of Kickstarter projects where physical goods are actually, for one, they're really hard to just manufacture, but also it's a lot of money in shipping. So it ends up being like a quarter of their entire budget, at least. If, yeah, if that's you why, want I, like, when you when Strike School is like, oh, if you get this much, you get an extra area or a bonus mission. Like, I get that. That doesn't make that makes sense to me. But when you ask for like pins and dinners and stuff, it's like, you you probably those are, those should. Are thing. Those are tiers versus stretch goals, but. Uh, yeah. I get stretch goals. I don't really don't get the whole tier thing. Like that doesn't make sense. Like all these goods you get. I mean, I'm, from the perspective of the of offering them, the, the very high ones could make some sense, and that they're a way for somebody who is legitimately, you know, stacked with money to donate a lot to something that they find interesting. Whereas normally, like, I don't know, not if someone donates like a thousand dollars to something. Well, you know, even like, get... like on the humble bundles and stuff like that. I don't know how Notches donated tons and tons and tons of money for games which he probably already owns or even is yeah. interested in or whatever and it's just sure. because they're trying you know it's, it's for the charity aspect of it too but i mean if you normally everybody just buys a game at whatever price it's set at i mean the idea is with a higher tier that they could they could donate a lot more i even get the whole normally one pay. of the tier bonuses being a pre-order you basically just bought the game but yeah I, don't get I like those. the ones that are more digital. Like, uh, there's a there's a pretty standard one of putting them all in the credits. Like, that's a pretty easy thing to do, and it doesn't or, cost. Or just giving you like a PDF or something. That that makes sense to me too, because all yeah, you're doing PDF is, is game, making yeah. one PDF and emailing it to everyone. And the soundtrack and all that stuff. Like the kind of thing you see in a digital special digital collector's edition. That kind of stuff is cool. And then like uh, naming uh, stuff in the game after people. Um, yeah. The physical goods are expensive. But I think Especially if you have like a fifty dollars shirt or something, it's like fifteen dollars of that fifty is gonna go to a shirt or twenty or twenty five. Yeah, this yeah, Kickstarter it, it's something that I, I I like, but at the same time I really really like dislike. And this has been an episode of Disclosure Alert. I would totally I would totally support a Kickstarter for Alpha Protocol too though. So Obsidian, if you're listening, you know you could just do something. Chris I want to kickstart for just Alpha tweeted. Protocol 1 for them to make the game that they wanted to make in the first place. That's what I want to see. You know, now, but now that they have this whole Alpha Protocol thing out there, it should be a little easier for them to make to go back and try something like this again. Hopefully. Yeah, they've got, the problem is Obsidian's so busy right now. Like, they, they were trying to pitch a Star Wars project, and they've got Project Eternity, and... And the Stick of Truth. Yeah, I forgot about that. That should be coming out, like, this year, shouldn't it? I don't know. I don't really. I don't really care about South Park. I just know that that's coming out. Yeah, I think it's this year. 
Um, yeah, Obsidian's got a lot on their plate. I anyway, think, but like, they have expressed interest in uh, doing something like Alpha Protocol again. Well, I'm sure they'd be interested. It's actually, it's Bioware like, actually wants to. They want to make a modern spy RPG. I saw that one. <laughs> They're working on a new IP, and we have no, and they haven't said what it is. So, I don't know if Anyways. I actually care. If Bioware made a spy RPG. It's the one where Anyways. you're gonna be, you're gonna be the last spy of your kind, and you're going to have to. What is that? They are aliens that are invading, and they threaten to harvest all the humankind. <laughs> yes. And with this riffing on Mass Effect, I think we're done with this week. <laughs> yeah, this was not too bad. Thanks for coming on, Seamus. Sorry. It's a lot. Yeah, we Sorry, yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. Sorry you had to use Skype. Always glad to have you, Seamus. But, uh, <laughs> we we did try to to ease you into it with a bit of old school. Thing. Was not bad. No, no, it's it's all good. It's all good. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, good I thought, show. Were, I thought yeah. you would be a bit angry about it, and I was going to let you vent there. No. But. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this was another week of Disclosure Alert for some reason. I'm Anaphysic. I'm Alduin. I'm Godchild. And I'm Seamus. And we'll see you next week for the finale. Thank you, guys. Thanks for watching. As always. is